Very good. Well, this is a, a momentous occasion, Mark. I was wondering when we were going to get to this. Uh, a question that's, uh, well, it's an episode that's going to ask some very, very big questions indeed. Uh, a, a delight to have you back uh, on to Uplink, of course, as ever. Um, this has been quite the journey. Um, but I, I'm going to throw a, a pretty big one at you now. So, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you're rather high up over at the European Space Agency. How goes the search? For life well yeah indeed um it's interesting because of course in my career um we, we've uh, we've seen huge changes in that regard not only in the sense that we have uh, discovered thousands of planets orbiting around other stars which now present us with actual opportunities to go and see seek possible signs of alien life, whether in terms of plants or primitive life or, you know, through things like uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, you know, maybe even intelligent life. Um, and we're not quite at the point yet where we can uh, go to other planets and, and land next to alien ships, as we see in the background here. But, um, you know, we, we, we know of many thousands of, of these so-called exoplanets. And we have several missions in construction at the moment, um, in development. Uh, which are aimed at searching for more of them, and in particular searching for those which might be in the so-called habitable zone around their stars, places where uh, water might be liquid. So we have the James Webb Space Telescope uh, being launched next year. Uh, we just launched uh, the KOPS small uh, mission uh, with Switzerland and others last year, uh, measuring the properties of exoplanets accurately. Uh, and then we have two new missions um, in, in development, Plato and Ariel. One will be looking for these habitable exoplanets and the other one will be measuring their atmospheres. So who knows, you know, in, in uh, not too many years time, we might have found planets with signs of what we call non-equilibrium biology, uh, non-equilibrium chemistry indicative of biology, uh, stuff, atmospheres that shouldn't be there unless something's fueling that constant change from underneath. Um, and at the same time, we're looking for life in the solar system. You know, we're sending in two years time the ExoMars rover off to Mars in order to dig beneath the surface and look for signs of past or even potentially present life there. And that links very nicely into who the speakers are today, because um, the first um, person we have on today is Nicole Kaplan, who's a research fellow with the European Space Agency. And she works on uh, what we would call astrobiology, so how life might work in outer space. And she does that by looking at what are called extremophiles, life on the Earth, uh, which exist in crazy conditions that certainly wouldn't suit you and I, but life can survive under those conditions. And then just to make it worse, she subjects it to even worse conditions by sticking them on the space station and zapping them with radiation and things like that. And our other guest uh, today is Adrian Tchaikovsky, um, well-known science fiction author, written many books uh, based around what you might call xenobiology or exobiology, uh, taking <clears throat> some species that we know from the Earth and placing them in extreme scenarios elsewhere in the universe or using the traits of some of the species we know on the Earth and exploring how that might be if they were sort of melded with human characteristics. So fiction at one extreme, but very much based in modern biology and then the stuff that we do on the ground extrapolated to space. Fantastic pair of speakers to have today. A fantastic pair of speakers who are uh, very, very kind of um, standing by. We're going to bring them in one by one and, uh, well, just see how far we get in the uh, <clears throat> search for life. Uh, let's just see if they're all set up. Okay, very good. I can see Adrian. Hello, hello. And I can see Nicole as well. <laughs> how are you guys doing? Welcome to Uplink. Are you receiving? I am indeed. Yes, receiving loud and clear. Thank you. For ah, fantastic. Well, well, uh, it's such an absolute pleasure to have you on. Of course, um, you know, among the many questions that space exploration seeks to answer, perhaps this is one that uh, I think for many people has the most ramifications because it cross cuts just about everything. But, you know, I, I, I think, uh, Adrian, I, I wanted to start uh, with you and your work because um, so much of it, uh, it doesn't deal with um, imagined uh, you know, uh, extraterrestrials, but you know, what, what you could almost call aliens among us, you know, um, you know, where, where did your journey in science before science fiction begin? Um, I've got a background in zoology. I did zoology and psychology at the, um, university level, but in all honesty, it started a long time before that. I've always been fascinated by 
the less human, I guess, of the uh, the things we share the world with, most especially spiders and insects and other invertebrates like that. And I kind of actually, weirdly enough, there was a convention, um, the Worldcon in London years ago, where they had a big stream of speculative evolution uh talks uh we had dougal dixon over who did um after man uh, who's very much one of the founding fathers of that particular field anyway and a lot of other really interesting thinkers and that's i think that must have given me the germ of all well, what why can't i just sort of see what happens if i evolve a thing from earth into a, a human level of sentience so in in uh children of time of course um, you kind of take an, an accident, you, you create an accident in which mutations um, intended for, you know, as we would say, more human-like, so, so um, apes, primates, um, somehow makes its way into spiders. And, and, and it's sort of a fascinating journey from the, the very primitive level all the way to, to the most advanced, including all the stuff to do with pheromones and, 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 and signaling. So a lot of that must involve, you know, a, a lot of detailed research because these are real spiders that do real things mm -hmm. on the earth. They're not, they're, they're not kind of fabricated things you've added on right, right from the outset. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I came across um, work by scientists like Fiona Cross on the um, on the Porsche spiders, so their 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 real world cognitive capability capability is frankly ridiculous for something that small with so simple a kind of a neural structure. And from there on, it was instant instantly. Well, what would happen if they had the chance to evolve? Because you've got there a creature that seems to be really pushing the envelope of what you can do with what it's got. And so, really, the the whole the whole setup of children of time is really an excuse to run that thought experiment. And then, and then also to show the very worst of human behavior at the same time, I would say at certain points in the story. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a bit of a cynic when it comes to my own species. <laughs> understandable, <laughs> understandable. Indeed. Well, I mean, it, it's such an interesting juxtaposition we have today, of course, because, uh, you know, uh, here we are talking about extrapolating the, an intelligence that is familiar and of this earth, but to many of us, an alien concept. And I suppose, Nicole, uh, I mean, so much of your work, uh, you know, uh, as I understand, probably just grapples with, um, I guess, uh, I don't know if this is an accepted term or not, but um, an expanded Goldilocks zone, you know, um, extremophiles and things that um, uh, defy what we originally conceived was was habitable, something that Mark was talking about earlier. What, what a habitable zone is, I think, seems to have expanded radically in recent years but but first things first you've got to set me right what is an extremophile <laughs> so um an extremophile uh is something a, a living organism that exists in in an environment that would be deemed extreme for you and i for human life and um, so for example uh there are various species of bacteria that can survive uh, whacking great amounts of radiation, extreme temperature fluctuations, extreme hot, extreme heat, extreme cold, um, pressure. So all of the things that if we were to go to space uh, without a spacesuit, we wouldn't survive, but some things actually managed to survive. And that is uh, in a nutshell what an extreme of is. So let me pick up on that because you and I have discussed this in the past. Um, you work on, on tardigrades, which, you know, let, let, we'll talk about those in a second, exactly what they are. But formally, tardigrades are not actually extremophiles in the sense they don't thrive in those environments, but they can survive them. So there is a bit of a dichotomy there, right, between extremophiles and animals, you know, which are just sort of indestructible kind of Tom Cruise Mission Impossible characters like, like tardigrades. So the thing about tardigrades is they are not the best example of an extremophile that survives space. And the reason they are so popular, I believe, is just because of how they look. Um, <laughs> because they're cute, right? Or, or, I, people are polarised. People either think they're very cute, um, fat-looking, cuddly creatures, or um, totally repulsive. but people can project some sort of human motion into a tardigrade and really capture the imagination and imagine that this is something that can 
live and survive and reproduce, thrive in space, when uh, the reality is uh, we've only actually sent tardigrades, or ESA have only actually sent tardigrades to space on one mission. Uh, and the data that we got back was very, very interesting, but actually showed that indeed, when you put tardigrades outside of the space station and you expose them to full space conditions, so unfiltered solar light, um, the extreme cold that is outside the space station, um, and all of the other variables, radiation, they, they, they can only be sent in a dried, desiccated state. You can't send them in the in in then you know in their normal um, hydrated state when they're milling about. They will not be able to survive those conditions uh, live. And I, I use that term loosely because desiccated, they are still alive, but they are dormant, if you like. So, so give us a again for the benefit of the audience, which is probably you know quite some generalists. Um, <clears throat> what are they? You know, give give me give me the the potted description. What's a tardigrade? So they are small uh, creatures, commonly known as water bears. Um, the biggest one will probably be about as big as a full stop uh, on a A4 sheet of paper with a 10 to 12 font size, say. Uh, they are uh, found in the environment, so they're found everywhere as long as there is water. And that's a very, that's a very important point because water is the essential requirement for life as we know it. It's the solvent for life. So when astrobiologists are talking about the search for life, that is where astrobiologists tend to start. <clears throat> so I just, just wanted to follow up on that. This, this desiccated state, if I remember, is, called, is that called the tun state, T-U-N? That's uh, right. So yeah. when you dry, dry down some rotifers, either on a thin film or um, on some other media, uh, they will completely, well, they'll, they'll lose all of their moisture, but they'll go into this tun state, which is kind of like a ball. So they'll curl up into a ball um, and their metabolism dramatically decreases. So if we delve into sci-fi, which I know everybody wants to do here, um, <laughs> it's kind of like going into stasis. Yeah, I think the, the the link is if I'm right. I mean, Adrian was certainly set me right if I if I've remembered the book wrong. But the first book of the uh, Three Body Problem trilogy by Qi Jin Liu uh, posits a, an alien world uh, which has multiple suns and everything's rather chaotic. And and they, uh, it, it's a it's kind of a VR game except it's not as you'll find out when you read the book. Um, and they they those aliens go into these states. I think of course they're 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 more like us. They're they're not tiny little things but uh, am i right adrian is it was it that i uh, yes i think I, th I think i think so so you've got yeah. you had the, the the kind of planetary history of a series of kind of catastrophes that they kind of reset from every time they have to go into this 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 state which just obliterates their culture if i remember it's been a while since i read it yeah yeah i think i think that's right so i think it must be inspired by by people having read about uh chi jin having read about uh, tardigrades yeah alex uh, well, no, I, I guess it's just, uh, you know, going back to, you know, uh, you know, trying to create something, but they, um, it, you're right, I, I think we can all agree, they are incredibly cute, but, um, but they're just the, almost like the beginning of what we're beginning to learn, right, about where organic life can live. I mean, what are some of the other examples, Nicole, of, 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 of life that we found in surprising places, which I guess by extension expands our, our concept of where life might be found elsewhere? When we're talking about um, real hardcore extremophiles that we sent to space, uh, nothing is queen for me as lichens. Lichens can be subjected to enormous doses of cosmic radiation and, um, and UV and all bands of UV, which is the main difference between the survival of a lichen and the survival of tardigrade. Now, when we sent tardigrades, and the experiment was called TARDIS, I thought I'd like to point out. Um, <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, if you put geeks in charge, look what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't in charge of that one, but I probably would have um, would have yeah, voted for that one. Uh, so when we sent these tardigrades uh, in this dry, desiccated state, we exposed them to full space conditions outside of the ISS for, this was a number of months, 
I can't remember. There's a, there's been a lot of experiments with various organisms, but the, the tardigrades have only been sent once. Um, so they were exposed to full spectrum solar light. So that's EVA, B, and C. Uh, when the tardigrades were exposed to UVA and UVB, they managed to survive. But UVC completely knocks them out. And the way that you can do that in space is by using different filters. So the tardigrades were desiccated and they were sent in these little sample cells and they were put in this, uh, this um, hardware container. Uh, it, it was on the exposed facility, um, which was uh, a multi-user uh, facility for using for sending different types of organisms to space. Uh, and there were two different compartments with two different filtering systems. So the one that filtered out UVC, the tardigrades that were in that survived, but the tardigrades that had the full spectrum, they, they really didn't survive. So UVC is the showstopper of the tardigrades. But but do we have any idea why that would have evolved in the sense that you know, even the most extreme environments on the Earth at high altitude. I mean, that may, maybe it's to do with the lichens, right? Uh, um, you know, why why would they have evolved the ability to survive that? They could have evolved at a different time when levels of UV um, UVC on Earth were a lot higher. Um, I'm talking about the lichens, right? Than than for tardigrades or a, a different geological period of time. We just don't know. But that okay. that feeling I get that it would have just been a different time point and they would have been exposed. It, it could even be just be a oh, fortuitous side effect of some other um, evolutionary adaption for something a bit more commonplace that just happens to have a yeah. knock-on effect of giving them a resistance to the UV. Sure. Yeah. I remember reading about, um, well, reporting on some of the exposed experiments. This is stuff that goes on the Russian, Russian part of the station, right? Uh, this was, um, so there was one on the European segment. Ah, and okay. So there's expose E, which was Europe. Yeah, and then okay, and expose R, 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 R too. So yeah, on the <clears throat> right. on that stuff. Yeah. Because I also remember that um, it, it, one of the things sent up, so there were the lichens and there were various um, forms of, you know, let's, things that you might expect to find on Mars without them actually running around or, you know, riding on bicycles, very primitive things. Um, but also for some bizarre reason, and I, you know, I just don't know enough about this because I'm too old, I think, uh, kombucha uh, culture was sent up there. This sort of, I, I mean, you know, why anybody drinks this stuff, I have no idea because it's some bizarre mix of yeast and bacteria, some kind of symbiont. It's I mean, really, really I know it's trendy, but I mean, it just sounds like something that is actually out of the film in the background behind me here, frankly. I mean, it's something that you sort of find walking across your living room and then decide to eat it. Well, I suppose that's what we do, right? But uh, so, Adrian, um, of course, spiders play, you know, the, the sort of uh, one of the key roles in uh, Children of Time and Children of Ruin. But of course, you've got ants in there as well. And I just love the way that you interplay between the various species and and use the uh the pheromone signaling the trickery uh that the the spiders are able to conquer and able to figure out how to make ants trick and and there's that that warfare that goes on between them and that's something you must have studied as well and it, most of us don't know anything about this this sort of let's call it be below human consciousness level of communication which involves signaling that we we barely participate in at all so i'm interested how you you know use that as, as a, a ploy in the books? Um, I mean, to a certain extent, it's actually my keystone for writing any kind of perspective that's not human is to get into the sensorium of it and how, because once you have an angle on how something is perceiving its world, that's going to give you a trajectory for how its thoughts might progress and what sort of technology it might develop and what sort of concepts it would even find um, important or interesting. Um, I mean, with the, the spiders and the ants, obviously, when, with a lot of very small creatures, sight is not terribly important because frequently you're in an environment where you can't see very far and you don't have the equipment to see very far. I mean, the, the Porsche spiders are an exception in that, but um, they still have a, a level of communication based on vibration and they have a level of communication based on um, scent. And ants are very, very dominated by scent. So when they're trying to fight off what is otherwise an overwhelming sort of physical force in the ants. They have to resort to um, effectively hacking the ants' own means of communication. And weirdly, when you were talking about research, 
Um, I got completely stuck with that. So I went, I went to the um, Natural History Museum and talked to their entomology department. And as it happened, someone had just come back um, from a study where they were collecting these porcid beetles, which are beetles that live amongst ants because of their sort of pheromonal uh, deception. And that just gave me the springboard to work out how my spiders were actually going to survive the chapter I was working on at that point. Yeah, it's a pretty brutal chapter. You do well. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's a testament to your art as a writer that, you know, there is a point in that chapter where you think they're not going to survive this. I know there's another 10 chapters in the book. There's another <laughs> 200 pages to go, but how on earth are they going to survive this? Of course, you also do flip it and, and, and engage with this idea that the Porsche spiders can see and the fact that they can see the light going overhead and, and they, mm -hmm. to begin with, have no idea what it is. It's, I mean, spoilers for anybody who hasn't read the book, but it's the human ship that's in orbit. But But of course, it's not. Got it. I mean, if I remember correctly, it doesn't have a human on at that port at that point. It's it's that it's a grey area as to precisely what it's got on board about that point. <laughs> <laughs> because of course, you use the book to explore that whole side of of AI as well, and and how AI beca can become conscious and in fact become psychotic. So I'm I'm curious in that regard when you, you know, when you when you try to meld these things what's the process for coming up with something which in the end feels completely credible that it could go that way but on the other hand is surprising we had we had alistair reynolds and pippa goldschmidt on a few weeks ago to talk about how they create worlds in that regard and of course they both have a scientific background so mm. is is that important to you or because you've also written fantasy novels which might depart a little bit more from science although the science and fantasy balance i understand is kind of you know it's an interesting area for you yeah i mean when i write science fiction um, hard science fiction like Children of Time, I kind of feel honor bound to make the science as good as I can make it. And there's still going to be a group of people who are sufficiently better informed than I'm ever going to be who will know, who will basically find the holes in it. But it's it's a matter of trying to minimize. And, you know, so far I've, I've had a, a cautious thumbs up from, you know, the spider behavioralist front and I've had, and from various other areas. And I, you know, I suspect there are all sorts of areas where I just don't know whether I've got it wrong. But so far, nothing glaring has turned up. Um, you I'm will gonna... never be able to please everybody with science knowledge. This is just, even if you are the expert in the field, somebody will pick you up. on. on is this on, a personal on... statement you're making here, Nicole, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think I speak for the entire scientific community. I speak for us all by authors everywhere you can you can be as well researched as you want science science facts as you hold them as facts will still be disputed by someone somewhere there's, there's always a guy on the internet right well i, I will say please um in, in children of ruin i do have um space giant spacefaring uh tardigrades so uh, <laughs> because it was it was just too appealing not to do it Ah, see, I, I, I think I outed myself uh, on social media yesterday of not, not actually having had time to read that yet. But, uh, but now, now, well, you know, we're, we're doing this <laughs> link right now. Um, I, think, I mean, uh, just, just to, no, sorry, go, go on. No, 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 go ahead. I oh, said so just, just to finish the answer uh, with when I'm writing fantasy or or less rigorous science fiction, it becomes more of a matter of making sure that whatever you're writing is consistent with everything else in that setting, rather than necessarily consistent with actual tenant you know, the scientific tenants so the, let, yeah let, let me well actually i've asked a couple of questions alex you go ahead and ask a question but I, i'll see if i can seize this one and come back to nicole on it no 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 it's 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 all good uh, no i was just going to suggest uh nicole to invoke another great science fiction sage uh stroke guru um you know you cannot win but there are alternatives to fighting um i think it's probably the best advice any of us have ever gotten, but I, I suppose, you know, science fiction, you know, it has a place in all of this, you know, because that is the kind of speculative realm in which we try and imagine where life might be, where we might find it and what it might look like and what it might seem like. And what's so interesting about Adrian, your work and, you know, having read Children of Time, it, it's, it's that it grapples with life we're actually familiar with, you know, the aliens, you know, in our back garden, you know, because we always, uh, I think, um, probably generationally uh you know i certainly grew up in in an era of science fiction where it literally is just so obvious you know i mean just uh you know you, you think of star trek for instance 
yet another franchise that has dined out on tardigrades as it happens, um, if you think of uh, which is kind of brilliant. Um, but, you know, all of their aliens are pretty much just people that look like any of us, but with like one thing changed, and that's an alien species. But, but, but the reality, it seems, you know, just coming from um, such different angles that both of you, I wonder if you agree on, is that um, were we to ever find it, it might look so radically beyond any, any of our actual experiences and research that we might not even recognize it. And another question is, do we actually want to find it? Okay, well, let me jump in here because there is this sort of, you know, rather interesting idea about the Fermi paradox, this idea that, you know, if life is supposed to be common in the universe, why isn't it here yet? And there are all sorts of posited um, potential answers. And indeed, in the three body problem, there's this whole thing called the dark forest idea that essentially, um, at any given stage of evolution that you might be in, there's going to be aliens who are more powerful than you. Uh, and it, you know, even, even if there's thousands of civilization that only needs a tiny fraction of them to be aggressive, and they will kill you as soon as you, you know, say, hello, I'm here. And the flip side to that is, evolution may progress at different rates and so you know even though somebody's less than you are today they might be greater than you in the future more powerful so if you find anybody that's less than you kill them and that sort of idea you know there's kind of the answer to the fermi paradox but another one is interesting which is this idea of the great filter the idea that life either is incredibly hard to start and so the filter is at the beginning the chances of everything coming together in the right environment in a stable way uh, to let life get to where we are today is actually very unlikely. Or the other end is that it happens fairly often, but as soon as they get to our stage, we kill ourselves off because we're not very clever. Uh, we have nuclear weapons and, you know, we have Tory politicians. No, all right. Um, you know, we go to a place which there's a, there's a pretty strict cutoff and, and life isn't very long. So when in the communicative phase, so it's just hard to find it. And the interesting part of that, and it's Nick Bostrom that pointed this out a few years ago, is that if we do find life on Mars or elsewhere in the solar system, then that would actually suggest life forms quite commonly. Because if you find it twice in one solar system, then it's going to be everywhere. And the problem with that is that that means the great filter must be at the end, meaning we don't have long to survive. Uh, I mean, it's a kind of, you know, it's a very hand wavy sort of thing from the oxford existential risk people but uh oh, I mean, Adrian, it, yeah. yeah i think i mean there are some potential other filters along the way um for example there was a very long period of time on earth uh, where there was life but there wasn't multicellular life yeah. which suggests that multicellular life is difficult um right. it's it's possibly it just needs a level of free energy that the kind of low oxygen world certainly um just didn't have available to it um I think there's also a, an argument that, uh, that the concept that Stuart and Cohen make in their book, What Would an Extraterrestrial Look Like, about intelligence and extelligence, and the idea that intelligence is something we have observed evolving multiple times on Earth, but extelligence being the sort of cultural intelligence that, that humanity has, has only happened the once. And obviously you can argue it's only happened the once because that then took over and precluded any other op potential for it happening but it we had life for a very long time without having any obvious signs of what we would consider um, high sentience and so that might be another filter you might um, the, the universe might be full of verdant inhabited planets that simply don't have something that's got to the level of ability to manipulate its uh, environment that we have got and yeah. therefore to endanger ourselves in that way yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, open that up back to Nicole, because, of course, you know, you mentioned earlier on that uh, water is a prerequisite for life. Of course, there are have been discussion uh, about whether that's actually necessary, that maybe uh, life could form, for example, in liquid hydrocarbons uh, in places like the moons of uh, Saturn and Titan in particular, well, particularly Titan. Uh, with the lakes of ethane and methane or you know maybe there's weird and wonderful ways of, of using other solvents but then there are energy issues with that right i mean it's it's very cold yeah. and there's not much energy available so so how how do you in the european space agency advise us 
the people who are the astronomers looking at other places, you know, how, how wide do we set our search parameters? Because you can look for water, you can look for that narrow range, but maybe it's elsewhere in the parameter space. So what we have at the European Space Agency is science, the science directorate and the astronomers and the wonderful people who are studying these distant worlds and exoplanets and potential habitable zones and uh, yeah, places that might find life life might be sustained and then you have something that's much closer to home which is what I'm directly involved in which is looking at life as we know it so carbon-based life that needs water as a as a requisite for life and um, and sending that out into space to see how that's reacting now my message here is that we start small so Whereas you're over in what you do in your directorate, you're looking at the grand scheme of things, right? And what I'm tasked with doing is organizing experiments that are really looking at not just the biology. So I, I'm, I'm a biologist, I'm, well, strictly I'm an environmental scientist, radio ecologist, carbon biologist, I, there's many things, but I wear an astrobiology hat. But I'm not an astrobiologist in the traditional sense um, that I'm looking at um, potential life on Enceladus and Titan and Europa. Um, so what, what we're doing is sending not only biology, but also looking at the chemical reactions. So we're, we'll be sending basic um, biochemicals into space to see how that is interacting with the environment, again, with the temperature fluctuations. Um, and, and the pressure and the exposure to unfiltered solar light, which we cannot do on Earth. We have this atmosphere. So in order to understand how these basic building blocks of life, if you will, react to space, we need to send them there. We just, we just cannot do it. There are various things you can do to simulate some space conditions on Earth. For example, uh, microgravity. You can, you can place experiments in a... Uh, in a 3D RPM, a 3D random positioning machine, which is this device which will turn um, samples all sorts of direction in a random direction to, to give it the impression of microgravity. Uh, we can also do experiments, and we do, we carry out experiments on parabolic flights, on sound rockets, um, that give some microgravity, if only for a matter of seconds or minutes. Um, but again, not outside of our protective layer. But since I, I, I mean, I, I, it's a leading question. Uh, I assume I can set up a, a bunch of lamps with UV, A, B, and C. I can, I can dose um, organisms with X-rays. I can chuck them in a, in a jar of perchlorates like the surface of Mars has all over it. Uh, why do I really need to go into space if it's not for the, the microgravity? Is it, is it really, I mean, is it the ability to have all of them in one place it's, at all at one time? It's the symphony of all of those things uh, in, in, you know, in, in one place. You cannot replicate true space conditions on Earth. You just cannot do it. So what you can do is if you want to study the effects of radiation, explicitly radiation, you expose an organism, a plant or some bacteria to um, certain energies, but you can't, and, and also the characteristics of cosmic radiation will be different to the characteristics that you get from submitting something to a high dose of x-ray. Right. So to get that, you would really need to send it to space. And that's, that's the need, that's the argument for why we do experiments in space on ISS and hopefully in the not too distant future beyond. So, so let me just pick up on, because I, we, we didn't mention it in the introduction, um, and I'm, I'm certainly fascinated to hear of your experience. So you actually have been to the Chernobyl um, exclusion zone um, relatively yes. recently, uh, as in not 30 years ago. So what was your experience? No. I mean, you know, were there giant spy, intelligent spiders running around potentially, <laughs> I mean, which you're not allowed to tell us about? What, what was it like? Any, I didn't interview any of the spiders, so I can't comment. Um, <laughs> I did see some spiders. Um, but no, the reason that I wound up in the exclusion is as part of my PhD. So I studied um, at the University of the West of England in Bristol, um, and I studied a PhD in radio ecology. So I was part of a consortia of uh, various scientists, 
mostly biologists who were looking at the biological effects of radiation on various organisms. So I was one of the plant people. There were people studying radiation effects on bees, on aquatic uh, invertebrates, uh, all, sorts of, all sorts of different uh, plants and animals. So we were using the exclusion zone as a model, as a field study, uh, for looking at the effects of radiation in the field with other factors. So I found myself there and uh, I was, so I'm a plant biologist, environmental scientist um, by what I studied. Um, and I was studying the model plant Arabidopsis. But we went in autumn when Arabidopsis isn't around. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of just ended up going along for the ride because the rest of the consortium, they were having a great time. They were sampling bees and they were sampling fish. And I was just kind of, uh, yeah, I was just going around for thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> of course, we only had this one, uh, yeah, this one trip. So right. I went along for a bit of a <clears throat> philosophical um, experience. But no, it's, um, it's an amazing place from the perspective of a plant biologist because if you walk around the exclusion zone, it is like nature has just taken back everything that humans have put there. So you have all of these abandoned buildings that are dilapidated and you have roofs falling in, but then you also have the most beautiful trees wrapping around the outside and going through windows and upstairs. And it's just, it's just breathtaking, breathtaking to it. What? And the message that I get from Chernobyl is that the earth will do quite well without us. <laughs> I'm sorry just, if that sounds... Uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you just good. briefly mentioned Arabidopsis um, as, a, as a plant. Of course, there's, there's lots of them behind you, right, effectively. Uh, they're yes. a model plant used on the space station a lot. Why is that? Again, what, what's special about that particular plant, that, that it could be kind of a, a model for biology? In, in such, so, I guess it, it's similar to Drosophila and fruit flies for animal biology, I think, right? Yes, in the sense that it was the first plant to have its genome entirely sequenced. So um, that, that was, it was the first plant. Couple that with the fact that it's everywhere in all sorts of climates, all sorts of environments at a specific time of year <laughs> um, and it's very, very fast growing. So you can study entire life cycles, seed to seed, um, very, very quick. In fact, as part of my PhD, I st study five generations of, uh, of Arabidopsis exposed to radiation, which uh, yeah, was, uh, I believe, a while ago. What would we know it as in our back gardens or, or it, it, you know, around what? Common what's name is the Thale Cress. The Thale Cress. Is it edible? That sounds good. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, there are you, other, oh. other, other cress varieties which are... Which have, you, ha, have you tried which, it? No, I haven't. Oh. Um, <laughs> kind of a PhD maybe, student were no, you. I probably, <laughs> I probably have, but um, unintentionally, <laughs> probably on a late night in the lab and, uh, yeah, just coming straight over from the student union bar and just needing a snack. Something. There you go. Um, but there are more nutritious, uh, fast growing plants that we are planning on sending um, to the ISS in the not too distant future. And they're a group of plants known as microgreens. So, microgreens are very, very fast growing, edible plants that are full of nutritious, um, yeah, and they make great addition to salads as well. Um, yeah, they are, they're, they're a good. They're a good food source for astronauts. So, Alex, you're about to say something. No, no. Um, I just wondered if I could just um, just uh, throw something in because, uh, well, it's not just us in this virtual room here, um, but uh, but a lot of people that have actually joined us today. Uh, and uh, you know, normally we'll have some questions at the end, but you know, sometimes um, things will kind of arise that are, are maybe worth throwing into the mix, and it touches on two things happening right now. Um, something that you briefly said, Nicole, uh, and also Mark's background. Um, and it's, it's about whether we actually want to advertise our existence, whether we want to find that life out there, of course. You know, I think a question um, asked incredibly well by, you know, Dan O'Bannon, Ridley Scott in Alien, um, but one that you've asked as well. I mean, what, what, what does the group 
think about that. Should we really be seeking it out? Is it a threat to us potentially? So I had a conversation um, last year with uh, Nova Spivak, who is the CEO of, um, of the company that sent the space to the moon, if you remember that story. So there was a clandestine payload uh, that was inserted onto the ray sheet, which uh, is, well, it was the Israeli lunar lander project that crash landed on the moon. Um, and on board, there were various things that uh, the Israeli space agency knew about um, in, in the shape of payloads with uh, lots of human knowledge that uh, Nova Spivak wanted to project out into space. And he already did this, I believe, on board um, the Tesla car that uh, was that was sent. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> it's one of my, what are, what are my trigger, trigger words right there? Tes, Tesla car. Tesla. Anyway, yeah. I can tell you're a Volvo man. Um, <laughs> I'm a cyclist. You know I'm a cyclist. Anyway. I know. Um, so, so alongside all of this, um, all of this knowledge, which was on some specially etched discs, um, were also some biological samples to include tardigrades. Now, when this crash landed, uh, <laughs> yeah, the tardigrades would have been put out onto the lunar surface. And this made a fantastic media headline. And uh, Mr. Spivak, quite, uh, yeah, quite um, excitedly told the press that, hey, I actually sent some tardigrades to the moon and I didn't tell anyone about it. And, 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 that, and that is, that's from my horse's mouth, that's, that's what he said to me, is that he knew that it would just create a fantastic story. Now I picked his brains about this because of course with what we do and sending anything to space, be it a piece of A4 paper to the ISS, we have to go through so many rules and regulations, planetary protection um, measures to make sure that we are not introducing anything into space that could be deemed as contamination. Um, now, <laughs> No one knew what he was doing in terms of what he was sending and where. So in a nutshell, the moon is classed as a category one location in terms of, well, as far as planetary protection is concerned. So it is not of uh, life detection interest. As far as we are concerned as, a, as humanity, there is no point looking for life on the moon. So you can kind of send uh, send what you want there, but it then opened the question: Do you should you be policing this? I mean, if the space agencies are making everybody jump through a million loops and uh, sign so much documentation to say, okay, we'll send this one piece of paper because it's not going to contaminate, but then a private entity can go and send what they like onto the lunar surface, <laughs> that then opens up this massive question yeah yeah so let me let me drop that over to to adrian because i'm sure you're aware that you know beyond that <clears throat> there is even discussion in california now associated typically california associated with um these ideas of sending sort of nano spacecraft to nearest stars uh using very powerful lasers this project starshot thing but also people talking about let's put biological samples on them let's deliberately fire them at the nearest stars in case some of them have planets uh to seed life because it's our right our life through evolution has the right to take those planets i mean if we, if we go there and we lose our life by um, bacteria then you know that's evolution we lose but if we go there and we win then that's that's what we should be doing right because that's what evolution has trained us to do so i'd be really interested for your take on that because the, oh, these are I people think that's a dreadful idea good lord yeah yeah i think that, i think that, that that's a positively psychotic idea it seems to be absolute ultimate in um sort of that human exceptionalism which is going to ensure if it wins out that we won't survive on this world let alone any others right um the idea that after we've gone we could be inflicting briefly lived pointless plagues on um 
on some other planet. I mean, it's quite, it's entirely possible that it's pointless anyway, because, you know, back, you send a bunch of bacteria, whatever they're going to find is going to be so f completely unearth like it's they'll probably have a better a better chance on a completely unin uninhabited planet than anything with a, a biome that already exists but i can't see any win in that whole scenario the, I mean, the idea that oh yes our bacteria have gone out and beaten up their bacteria or even our bacteria have gone out and are having a whale of a time on some lonely rock orbiting another star there's no i mean Unless you're absolutely convinced that there's no life anywhere else, and it's our job to just keep life as a general concept going. Well, well, I think within the philosophy, I mean, and, and to be clear, I'm, you know, I certainly don't agree with it. I'm very much along the, the line you are. You know, it's very much this sort of manifest destiny idea, this idea that we, we are the people at the pinnacle of, of evolution as we know it. It is our right. It's not only our right, it is our, it is our destiny to do so. I mean, and you're aware of this, right? This, is, this fuels a lot of the discussion about well, should we send uh, humans to Mars and, and everything else. It's, it's, it's a big topic in the public domain today. Maybe we should send missionaries, missionaries, tiny tardigrade missionaries, Tiny tardigrade Bibles. Um, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> only, only Christian tardigrades. Holy, um, I, 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 I honestly, I don't have the vocabulary to express just what I think of that entire idea. Yeah, but but it, but, it, can... but it raises this interesting topic. I mean, so let's just finish on this one. You know, how do we engage as a as a culture beyond science, beyond science fiction? You know, how, these are press becoming pressing topics, maybe not the thing of sending life to other stars, but certainly sending humans to Mars and how that might then impact our ability to detect life there. But also, if life is already there, what what right do we have to place what in some arguable way is a more developed biome? I mean, not to, not humans per se, but all of the other stuff we come with um, might be able to immediately route very simple life that's scrabbled a hold on the Martian biosphere today. So how, from the perspective of a, you know, of a, because you're not constrained by the rules that the European Space Agency might be, how do we engage with the public on this? You know, how do we actually create a dialogue on this topic? Because it's not actually science fiction. It's on the edge of happening. Well, I mean, all I can say, I guess, is I've done my best. I mean, at the beginning of Children of Ruin, you have a terraforming expedition that hits their target planet and finds there's already a functioning biosphere there. And the commander makes the executive decision that they're not going to do it, despite the fact that that's what they've traveled 30 light years to do over you know, over however many years it took them to get there. And they said, right, there's another world in the system it's going to be a lot harder we're going to have a crack at that one but we're leaving this one because we don't have the right to just trample over it um so i mean what's what power i've got to influence thought on this sort of topic comes from what i can write and so i've written that I think it, it is interesting, and it's one of the things we've talked about in Space Rocks before. I mean, sometimes Space Rocks are a little sort of straight ahead, you know, astronauts meet rock musicians. But, it's, you know, from the perspective of Alex and I, it's very much about these these intersectional things, you know, where, where culture meets uh, space. I mean, there's the whole the diversity issue, you know, transparent access and so on, the, the kind of elitism of space. But all this, these cultural questions, because at the general public level, they hear about it every day, you know, that this stuff is, it's inevitable. We're going to go there now. We're going to do it. And I'm at a bit of a loss, frankly, to know exactly how to form a kind of brains trust that we that we think about these things and don't just allow the manifest destiny guys to just run away with it, uh, particularly when they're billionaires with rockets. Let's put it, that, you know, not to put it uh, too fine a point on it. Absolutely. Well, I mean, well, this is an interesting point, though, isn't it, Mark? Because, you know, I mean, this look at how this conversation has evolved, you know, literally just from something that is fundamentally um, mind blowing, just, you know, something that could rock everything to its core. I mean, just like the thought that finally there is, you know, absolutely uh, indisputable proof that humans are not the center of the universe, right? You know, and, and in Western thought in particular, this has been a, a you know, like a, a, a key issue, you know, a key problem, because that sort of, that idea of, you know, human preeminence of, of you know, our culture's, you know, kind of uh, right, you know, to hold dominion over others and so on is, is, is hugely problematic. And, and it's interesting how, um, you know, things like manifest destiny and other concepts, which have been so destructive, um, come up in the context of space exploration these days. And I wondered for, you know, Adrian, I mean, that's what science fiction 
does when I think it's doing its job really well is it is not just speculating on, you know, just what things might look like or what those experiences are, but also the ethical dimensions, you know, almost it's, it's almost like a kind of a, a, a playground with which to explore um, moral dilemmas, um, you know, ethical problems and, and uh, you know, unintended consequences sometimes. W w would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, it's the idea that we predict the future. I mean, it's always nice when you put something in a book and it turns out so many years down the line to actually be true. But it, it, is, it is far more about holding a mirror up to the now, I think, or holding at least a mirror up to the immediate tomorrow. And the best way you can do that is with these thought experiments, you, with the what if. And yet, for you know, some reason, despite the fact that science fiction has done that incredibly prophetically over the years, as you as you say, um, it's still held to be this sort of niche nerdy thing that uh, um, you know that if, if I was if you to go on mainstream television and and you know, and say science fiction, you know, it's 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 a way of holding up a mirror to society. Most people would actually say, no, no, it's just a nerdy thing. It's you know, and I I find that worrying, you know, not worrying, disappointing in a way. Um, the crossover to genres is, I mean, even Ian Banks, for example, had to write in two complete, you know, two names, two genres in order to be a kind of accepted. He couldn't write on, it was the same name with the letter M in the middle of the list, but, uh, <laughs> So, you know, we knew it was the same guy, but um, so it, how does that crossover work? Because, you know, you're at interface between two subgenres, one might argue, science fiction and fantasy. Well, in the last, I mean, honestly, I think fantasy is still kind of there. Uh, certainly the kind of the heroic epic fantasy style stuff it's <clears throat> game of thrones has probably been the biggest um step it's made towards the mainstream recently but it's still off to the edge but honestly in the last 10 years or so i i feel we've seen a real um window shift for science fiction into into something that is far more mainstream i think that it's come along with the fact that as you say it's space news as it were is now front page news for everyone you know the idea that this this or that um, billionaire has has fired a car into space or whatever is everyone is aware of it and it's become it's gone from being a look a, being a joke to being a real thing of you know let's yeah we're going to have holidays on a space station we're going to have um you know we're looking at um private enterprise in space we're looking at space companies it's something that has been i mean one wonders whether, whether there's been an actual sort of concerted campaign to do so but it's some it's something that's become part of the public consciousness in a way it absolutely wasn't say 10 15 years ago um and science fiction has 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 either come along for the ride or been part of the motor driving that i don't know which mm -hmm. but it's certainly i think weirdly more respectable now and it could just be part of the whole nostalgia kick we're on culturally that everything yeah. that you were interested in when you were a kid you're suddenly getting back again mm. um and therefore it's not embarrassing to say that you like a superhero movie and it's not embarrassing to say that <laughs> you like you know you're a fan of star wars and whatever and it's kind of come along with that but what it whatever is the push uh i think science fiction and science fact have both become far more of a thing that the average person is interested in so Nicole, I'm interested. We haven't actually ever talked um, about, you know, your engagement with science fiction, uh, fantasy. Do you do you have one, or are you, you know, are you one of so our button down? Do... What button down scientists? So I, <laughs> I did wonder um, when you invited me onto this uh, this live stream because, well, Alex would know because I, I've spoken to Alex about this before. I'm probably the least sci-fi person in the entire <laughs> space agency. I, I, I think so. And I um, I went to Destination Star Trek uh, last uh, last November to give a stage talk um, that was about yeah, life in extreme environments and, uh, yeah, and the types of life that you might find in space. Um, but I haven't ever, and I still haven't seen an episode of Star Trek <laughs> and uh, I know everyone's just kind of like, oh. No, no. <laughs> The, tr the, the true acid test is whether you've seen 2001 you know i mean i have to, alex just put your finger on the uh, cut off button right now <laughs> indeed <Yeah. Can laughs> I, um, to, to the airlock i know and i haven't and i will tell you why um that wasn't my upbringing i have the i have parents that 
have no interest in space and science. And when uh, some of my colleagues would talk about, um, oh, you know, when we were kids, we would go on a on a Saturday day out to the to the science museum or the natural history museum. We never did anything like that. And so I didn't have that exposure. I didn't have that planted. You know, I had, didn't, didn't have that seed planted. I became curious about science through conventional schooling. So just and through the, I suppose the natural world and my garden and studying a little bird on a leaf, that sort of thing, rather than kind of, you know, having that, this is science, like presented to me. And it just, I just didn't have that. And so I think if you, yeah, if your parents have no interest in the, in science and, and science fiction, then you're going to maybe end up like me. Now, it, it's not that I don't <laughs> want to. I have sci-fi books on my bookshelf. Um, but I think this is a bit of a hangover from PhD life. I feel like if I'm reading anything, it needs to be, it needs to be factual. It has to be nonfiction. Um, <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's the same reason that I used to play video games, that I hung up my controller, my Xbox controller, on the 1st of October 2014, which was the date that I started my PhD, because I knew that I would just get sucked into playing video games all the time and I wouldn't end up doing my work. So I think it's the same kind of things. I want to indulge in sci-fi, but I kind of have this, this guilt, which I will hopefully eventually move past and, and be able to, be able to <laughs> can, can I, um, if you were moved to, to break this for one book, um, there's a book by Sue Burke called Semiosis, which kind of does what I do with spiders, but with plants. And given okay. your speciality, um, it will be fascinating to see what you made of it. Semiosis. Semiosis. It's a re I mean, I, I, I absolutely loved it. It's a phenomenal book, but it is very much a, I, I believe she's a, 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 a I believe she's a, she's a scientist in professional life. And it's a really interesting take on alien plant, ev plant like evolution. We, we love nothing more than recommendations on Space Rock, so uh, I will... Uh, I'm not that, saying that, that I haven't down. ever read a sci-fi novel, <laughs> and I do, I, and I remember one in particular because it left such an impression on me, um, and that was Spares by Michael Marshall Smith, which I think was a phenomenally written novel. Um, but again, I read it many, many years ago before I started studying and then allowed myself the pleasure of actually enjoying, enjoying uh, yeah, science fiction and not just studying science fact. Kind of sounds a bit sad, doesn't it? But... Sounds like I'm gonna to have to have a word with your boss, Nicole. You know, you're in, you're in <laughs> lockdown, you know, you've got, if they can get you off the space station, you know, take the, you've obviously been it's up there too long. It. It's not, yeah, it's not yeah. enough books apparently, but okay. Well, I, um, I, I, uh, uh, I think semiosis sounds fascinating and I think that's definitely should be the basis of a follow-up uplink at some stage. Um, uh, but unsurprisingly, um, many of the people who are um, actually watching via our YouTube channel have come up with many, many more recommendations as well, Nicole. So <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, your, uh, your reading and viewing list is excessive. But it, it's, it's interesting, though, that Star Trek comes up um, with uh, a, a lot of frequency, um, particularly, Adrian, just like uh, in you talking about this kind of state of nostalgia that we seem to be in for, you know, many of our childhoods. Because one of the things that it posits you know, at least for the human species is, you know, a, a federation of planets where it is allied itself with, you know, other extraterrestrials and so on. And that, you know, we are governed by uh, not just a moral code, but actual laws that dictate, you know, how we interact with each other and new life and everything else. What is the actual state of play question for the group when it comes to actual policies that say we shouldn't really shoot uh, space bears at the moon, for instance, um, you know, uh, there is an ethical code. I mean, because, you know, I have to say, and Mark, I'm sorry to do this to your blood pressure, but, uh, you know, when, when I see Tesla's being launched into space, as an observer, I have to ask, um, what, what is actually governing space right now? And what's telling anyone with the right rocket that they can't do the very things that we all think is a generally a bad idea? Nicole, of course, pointed out the fact, you know, the, the, the civilian space agencies are subject to 
lots of i mean broadly speaking self-imposed restrictions you know we're we are interested as, as scientists and as human beings in preserving space that we can investigate and study and the idea of sort of polluting it uh, whether that's with defunct satellites which we've done a lot of uh, or by sending experiments to places where there might be life we certainly evolved our views over the years but many of the laws which govern this are actually decades out of date they were well written in the 60s based largely on the antarctic treaty so-called um, treaty on the peaceful uses of outer space have a lot of things in but they're not really well tuned for a day for a, a world in which indeed people can privately send probes to the moon um and you know how governments might behave is subject to a whole raft of potential sanctions between governments but how individuals behave the rogue individual um you know it's not so easily covered what's the individual sanction against that so I think, again, it comes back to the question I was mentioning before, how do we create an environment which is more suited to the next stage of space exploration, which is certainly very vigorously proceeding? Um, how do we ensure that we don't just go out there and do the same crap that we've done to the planet we live on here? I mean, again, it's sort of pointing this at Adrian, I mean, you've, you've in a fictional sense, you've done a very good job of, of polluting planets with with human crap um, for the sake of investigating how that would work or not. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, you mentioned it right at the beginning, you know, that, or maybe it was before we came on air about being cynical about humans and, and their mm. ability to self-police and self-govern. Um, and I would just ask you that, that question, you know, at the same time as science and science fiction have come more into the current mainstream um, and been more present, one could argue that human beings are behaving even worse than they have. Um, so perhaps this presence of science and these discussions is actually not actually having an influence. It's a hobby horse of mine a little bit that at the same time that science communication has improved, there's more good material out there. Human society seems to be going to rather baser uh, positions. So I'd be interested to hear your take on that. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know, as we're currently set up, I don't think that there is any way we can apply those controls because there's no one who has the power to apply them who has an interest to apply them. I mean, uh, quite, quite the opposite, I think, in most cases. Um, you know, short of a godlike alien intervening or an AI taking over the world, I don't really see that there's any capability to put a break on our more selfish and destructive inter um, interests. Yeah. I mean, one could even posit that we're right in the middle of one of those experiments, right? Um, an, an alien thing has arisen out of nowhere uh, and is uh, <clears throat> able to defeat us in many circumstances, and we're not taking one unified approach across the world. Mm. We're acting very differently from society to society, depending on to zero thought other considerations, uh, whether it's selfishness or the or the economy. So yeah, this pandemic is almost a science fiction experiment in some regard. Yes, um, I mean, we are seeing really very polarized responses. We're seeing extreme selflessness on behalf of a large number of people. And we're seeing, unfortunately, extreme selfishness on behalf of a small number of people. It just happens that the small number of people wield disproportionately greater political power. There's a lesson hey. there, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. We're, we're li right in the middle of it, or, we'll, or very soon we will be. So, Alex, do you have uh, other questions from the audience? I've noticed Indeed. we're uh, just past the hour, but uh, we, yeah. if, as long uh, as everybody's uh, happy to continue a bit longer, we would uh, be happy to go we're, on. Uh, we're, uh, we're getting up to uh, yeah, uh, just uh, about the hour mark, which means it's uh, uh, yeah, a good idea to you know bring some of the audience in, um, you know, who have, you know, uh, I think a, a lot of really um, good questions, you know, and, you know, I think, you know, many of which, you know, they've been covered, you know, uh, to, to some extent, you know, or another, but, um, you know, there, there, there's something that Mark, you, you touched on, um, very briefly, um, that was asked by ANT, um, saying is planetary protection regulated by, uh, the United Nations office for outer space affairs? Um, is, uh, is that what you're referring to when you're talking about the Antarctic treaty having been extrapolated to, to space policy? Yeah, so there is this uh, subcommittee, uh, various committees of the United Nations, which are charged with this. Um, the COPUS, um, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, uh, that effectively hold 
the, the, this treaty on the uses of outer space. And there are all sorts of bits and pieces in there, again, that relate to kind of the the status quo in the 1960s between the superpowers. Uh, and, and for example, that, you know, if you, you, you can't lift resources, uh, you can't claim a celestial body for your own, you can't um, exploit those resources. Now, lots of loopholes are being written into that saying, ah, well, you can take the resources away from that body and use them elsewhere. And now you have Luxembourg and the United States creating their own sort of unilateral declaration on what that means. So there is time, there really is time for that to be revised because we are in this state, you know, only look a few years into the future at what will happen when the first and I don't mean it in any negative way, the first Chinese uh, astronauts arrive on the moon and decide they want to you know, have a visit of Apollo 11. Um, the United States has declared a ring around that and said, you shall not go within a certain room. And of course you would agree, it's a, it's a historical memorial at this point. Um, but who polices that? There's not exactly something going to turn up and, and say you can't do it if you're the only people on the surface of the moon. So it comes partly back to the, the thing that Nicole was talking about, the, the whole Bereshit experience, which was basically without consequence at all, right? Well this is uh, to follow on from that. So the Coast Guard, the Committee on Planetary Protection, those uh, categorizations are merely guidelines. They're not yet written into law. So there's nobody out there at the moment that's going to be prosecuting for, to think, can you imagine if this, if, if this clandestine payload of tardigrades was sent to Mars? that's absolutely messed everything up for life detection missions on Mars. Of course, the argument, the argument goes that as soon as you send humans there, you have the same issue because we're symbionts with all sorts of blinking creatures, right? Um, but of course, there are, you know, there are all with these subtle nuances on these rules that you can go to certain locations where there's less likely to be biology. Other regions, you certainly shouldn't send your probes to unless they've been fully sterilized. But again, you know, we know that life finds a way uh, and, 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 and engaging in that experiment to start with on the basis, you know, oh, well, it'll be all right. It's like, well, we've done that quite a bit on the earth. Oh, don't worry. Let's introduce this species to Australia to eat that species. That always works out well, right? Um, I mean, again, in, in Adrian's uh, Children of Time, you know, the, the spiders were not intended at all. Uh, they just happened to be sort of um, lucky passengers. Okay, took them a while to evolve, but uh, those unintended consequences you see all the time on the Earth. Uh, so the fact that we're somehow going to get clever when we do it in space is a bit of an uh, unlikely uh, circumstance, I would say. Yeah. Well, um, there, there's a really uh, interesting one. Um, and it, it kind of touches on your experience of Chernobyl, um, Nicole, you know, just like this, this uh, process of witnessing nature reclaiming, you know, uh, uh, you know, what had previously been human occupation, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've seen the recent series, I've also been absolutely fascinated by that part of the world, seeing wild animals running around and so on, it, it just almost seems like life is flourishing there. Um, in ways that uh, I, I would not have imagined is possible. So, that, so, so the, the, the question really is, um, uh, you know, I guess, you know, for the group, but I think Adrian, given your work, um, particularly with, uh, you know, Children of Time and so on, were humans to, uh, you know, suddenly vanish for no reason, what species do you think would take over? Um, you know, I, I guess this presupposes that intelligence is, an inevitability, but, uh, but but where do you think it would go from there? And I guess uh, extrapolating to 100,000, 100,000 euros. Um, there's actually, there's a, a glorious uh, program called The Future is Wild that was on quite a while ago and is really hard to track down at the moment, which, which did this thought experiment. I think it went to um, 10,000, 100,000, 200,000 years and looked at what things might evolve. And um, I mentioned Dougal Dixon's After Man, which does the same. And he starts with the rather depressing idea of well, what species have actually survived long enough to out-survive us. So he's mostly working with rats and rabbits and things like that and having them evolve into the kind of familiar ecological niches that are currently held by sort of more familiar sort of large carnivores, large herbivores and so forth. I mean, for actual intellect, I mean, I, I guess my knee jerk is to go to the, uh, the cephalopods, um, octopus, uh, octopi, because they seem to have such incredible potential. 
Um, but someone has recently pointed out that actually, if you're looking for stuff that's already on land um, and will almost certainly out survivors because of how adaptable they are, uh, crows hmm. and other corvids are a really good candidate because they're they're already kind of at the social tool using stage. They're kind of you can almost see them as analogous to chimps in a lot of ways. Right. Revenge of the dinosaurs, right? After 65 mm. million years, <laughs> they, 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 they get the planet back. I, I, I'm intrigued by your, because it comes back to this question about, you know, how, how incumbent is it on intelligent life to have a big brain? I mean, it's sort of posited that, you know, opposable thumbs and a big brain uh, have, have given us the flexibility and adaptability. But you talked right at the beginning about the Porsche spiders, which can't have many neurons after all packed into their head, but they are very adaptable and they can learn same with the crows uh, same with the kephalopods I mean, if you think about you know as you say uh, octopi um, remarkable creatures so from your zoological background how much do we really understand what the what the base level is that's needed to have something which is sort of adaptability intelligence um i mean i think animal behavior has has as a study has lagged a bit because there was there was a a sort of the Skinner school of thought, which is pretty much treating animals as machines, and the idea that, and and steering steering clear of any kind of supposition that smacked of anthropomorphism, which unfortunately then kind of cripples your ability to really look at how animals genuinely can think and can solve problems in a way that is innovative rather than simply mechanical. Um, but we, it's when when you start looking, you can see examples of animals. Uh, being innovators, individual animals and animal species and animals learning from other animals um, all over the place. And it's very hard, it's frequently very hard to reconcile with our own fondness for the size of our brains. Like you say, I mean, it, it, it seems it, it seems possible there are the brains of some types of animal are simply more efficiently um, organized so that they can do more with less, for example. If I also, I mean, one thing we haven't really touched on very much, but it's implicit in, in, in your books, at least from the perspective of the ants, is the idea of, of you social animals as well, creating a kind of, a, for want of a better word, hive intelligence. Um, mm. Have we, I don't know. I mean, of course, those animals have existed for billions, well, for not billions, but hundreds of millions of years on the earth already. Have they reached a threshold? Is there a point beyond which they cannot go? Or, I mean, you, you're laughing there, Nicole, so maybe it's something you've worked on, but... Uh, uh, me or Nicole, do you want to go? Uh, I, I was just curious why Nicole, you know, when I mentioned you social animals and so on, why you, you, you raised your eyes there. Maybe it was somebody making noise outside the house, I don't know. No, no, it wasn't. It's, it's because we're, um, we're dealing with very tiny, we're dealing with microorganisms and plants um, in my department. So when you're talking about social animals and, uh, yeah, because of a higher organisation, which I don't like that term, but... Um, yeah, it just seems very distant for me. Oh, come on. I'm sure water bears, tardigrades, they must have little cuddly families where the little ones walk behind and they they go to tea parties. No, anyway. See, but so. this is what I'm talking about <laughs> when I say they capture the imagination. So, Adrian, yeah, go and jump in back on the you social animal aspect. Well, I mean, one of the things that that is kind of exists at the sort of level that Nicole works at, I guess, is her slime moulds um, have remarkably complex behaviors that I think we still don't particularly understand how despite the fact that they exist as a colony of individuals but the colony will do things for the colony's benefit which seems to mess around with how we feel Darwinian evolution works a lot of the way and we, um, And now, you know, I'm going to confess, I've now lost track of what the original question was. <laughs> Whether or not, I mean, we were talking about individual species taking over, you know, because I think Social it's... animals, yeah. Is it, is it one of CMAC's books? I can't remember. It's, um, Clifford D. CMAC has a book about the future evolution of human beings. I think dogs take over, but also the ants end up taking over the world in another way. And they actually depart to another dimension. It's all very, it's a fantastic, I, I don't know, city... Is it called the city? Is that right? I think city, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, as for, with social animals, it's very difficult to know. I mean, the way that ants make, we, we've kind of studied, we have studied how ants make decisions. And they it's not, the, the traditional idea of there being a queen ant that tells the ants what to do is, is, not, is not the case in any way. Um, the ants are, in fact, remarkably democratic. 
the ants make decisions communally and you so a bunch of ants will go out of the hive and they will find various places that have food and they will come back and say here's food and the kind of you'll get to a majority point where it tips and the ants will go to where most ants have gone to find food and fascinatingly there's a theory that our the neurons in our brain make decisions in basically the same way so that an ant colony is acting like a a brain formed of many individuals and then of course you have the ants individual ants also then have a certain amount of processing power and this is in um in children of time the spiders end up effectively co-opting ant colonies as their computers by right. using this kind of um this kind of network whether that would ever give you something that was conscious it's hard to say because of course there's no thing there the colony exists in the interactions of its units but it doesn't exist as a there is no kind of brain bug in the starship troopers sense um to be to be thinking and to be scared of us and to be making decisions um and yet the colony does make decisions and it makes decisions in this weird chaos math sort of cascade of very simple things making very complex behaviors mm. and of course over the course of the millions of years they've been around ants have evolved insanely complicated and in very human relatable behaviors like farming and warfare and slavery and all the other lovely things that we share <laughs> with them um but and, but also of course they um there are colonies that have evolved um cooperation between colonies and there, there are co there are colonies that i think that i think is a south american species that has been kind of inadvertently exported around the world and the ants recognize each other as being of the same colony all around the world so there is a mega colony of ants that is that has gone completely global and <laughs> recognize its own just that, just like capitalism it says you know we've gone global now yes you know we have the, the secret handshake everywhere in the world we we know who's on the inside amazing well uh, uh this is a very broad one um but uh you know i think it kind of speaks to you know both adrian and nicole's work um you know is is there a danger that we've already discovered life or even intelligent life but we just haven't recognized it you know i mean you know if it's um what we've actually seen or you know just what what do you think well, absolutely. If we're looking for life as we know it, and there exists life as we don't, then there's no way of knowing. Um, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry to not be more profound than that, but... Yeah. I mean, the, the basic criteria for life is not actually that complicated. There is a kind of an inexorable logic that if you have a system where some part of it can replicate, and if that replication is imperfect, and if there is some sort of limit on resources, evolution is kind of going to happen. Um, you know, you you can we we've we've made it happen in the in in the lab. You can you can set up any kind of system where you set the rules, and and you will get your usually I think it's yeast they often do this with. You will get it adapting to best survive what you put it in. Um, and that needn't even be um, talking about molecules uh, and the biochemistry we're familiar with. It could be if you had some sort of um, an energy wave, and I'm, I'm drawing on the Stuart and Cohen book here again, um, that was self-perpetuating in some in around the the sphere of a star. Theoretically, that could evolve if those few rules are in place there could be all manner of life that we would literally never recognize i mean i, I wrote i wrote a story called gods of the ice planet with a rather dramatic title um a while back where humans land on a an ice planet and they go through their whole kind of colonial cycle going from initial colonization to being all over the place to the human space effort kind of falls away and then the last people are left stranded on the planet and in that time the local life of the planet has got as far as walking up to the doorway and going because it lives on such a a slower time frame that it's not been recognized as living because it's working on an almost geological time because of such a low energy environment uh, and of course on earth we have higher energy environments and therefore anything like that will be outcompeted. But on a, on a very cold planet, that might be literally the best you can get. And in a given enough time, you don't know what might develop in that unthinkably slow way. Mm. Yeah, and it comes back to this question we, we mentioned earlier on, is how do we as scientists, when we're actively looking for environments where life might exist, you know, how, how, if not anthropomorphic or anthropic we are, you know, 
to what extent, how, how wide a parameter space can we recognize uh, or, or, or probe? Um, you know, certainly follow the water has been the message, message from many space agencies. And that's certainly a sensible one because we know life can be there. It, it brings me back to this point, with, which is often said about um, extremophiles, is that because life on the Earth is found in many, many very extreme places, that it, they, it can exist in such places elsewhere in the universe. I think, and to come back to you, Nicole, the logical flaw, at least for me, there is it didn't evolve in those places or it didn't form in those places. It's evolved to colonize those places. Um, so the real question is, what's the base environment where life can first form and then evolve to colonize incredibly bizarre environments? I mean, do, do we, excuse me, do we actually know today where life first formed on Earth? Uh, there are various theories. There's the panspermia theory, which I think you mentioned earlier on. Um, yes, it's there's conversion, evolution the theory. There's many, many theories out there. Religious theories as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the basis of this conversation, I think we'll um, leave those alone. All right. Um, but if we think about black smokers, for example, the, you know, the, the, tr the sure. trenches in mid-Atlantic where there's abundant energy and nutrients mm -hmm. or, or minerals, at least. I mean, do, are we any closer? I, I, if, I'm not if, an expert if in the field. Some life, if, if the life form first emerged there um, using the, the energy available and, and, and the solvent and so on and so forth, what's to say that it couldn't have happened in that Goldilocks environment in another world where there are also black smokers? No, I agree. I, all I'm saying is that this idea, what, what you often hear people is, get, is make the, what I think is a logical fallacy because we find life in lots of extreme environments on the earth that necessarily suitable for life. The question is, you've got to start it first somewhere and then evolve into those environments rather than it, you know, suddenly evolving in the vacuum of space. Maybe it can't do that, but obviously you can, you can then survive you, in space. If you, if you think broader, and this is specifically your area, look at the formations of galaxies all over the universe at similar times, different times. What's to say that life didn't evolve in that kind of model? Can you see where I'm coming from? Yeah, no, look, I mean, from an astronomer's perspective, I would be utterly dumbfounded that there wasn't life elsewhere in the universe. I guess I'm more interested in kind of the you said it earlier on, you're, you're an astrobiologist from the biology perspective. There are lots of astronomers who've kind of turned themselves into astrobiologists who basically always say, oh, well, any old environment can have life because look at how widespread it is on the Earth. And I'm actually, as from an evolutionary perspective, concerned that that's not particularly rigorous. Uh, it may have to form in a particular place or a certain set of environments. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. We've got, you know, billions of stars in the Milky Way and billions of galaxies each as big as the Milky Way. The statistical chances of there not being life elsewhere are very, if very the conditions, If the conditions are there and the ingredients are there, what's to, what's to say that it, that it hasn't, that it can't? Well, de depends what the magical moment might need to be, right? And this is what we, we've all been struggling with for years. We don't know. Maybe it's long-term stability. Maybe it's Jupiter there to suck up comets to avoid the Earth being hit repeatedly and resetting the mechanism, uh, not being around a binary star, which most stars are actually in, you know, in binary systems. Um, so, yeah, we don't know. I mean, it's, it's a great field to be still studying, right? Because it's... And on, on the other hand, the life that currently lives around our nearest binary star may well have written us off because we're not. <laughs> Yeah, precisely. Yeah, it would be. It would certainly, uh, uh, you know, I guess uh, one day late for a tal day. It would be a very Douglas Adams explanation for everything, certainly, which I think is a, a nice way to uh, to end it. Uh, you know, a ceaselessly fascinating uh, uh, topic of you know debate and exploration. Um, on behalf of everyone at Space Frogs and everyone who's joined us today, Adrian Nicole, can I just say what an absolute pleasure it's been to have you aboard. Thank you so much for your time and for the stimulating Thank discussion. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And, and the one thing we do before we go, because we're just geeks, uh, so we the space rocks. So space <laughs> and rocks, uh, two of them together. So everybody can do a Vulcan. Yeah, Alex has got his thumb in the right perspective, oh, right? Very you're good. Saying, uh, you're yeah. saying I'm a Star Trek fan, but man, that's uh, okay. Very good. <laughs> well, that's, that, that's something I learned in November. Absolutely. Very good. Very good. Well, well, so, thank you so much for your time. And uh, do stay in touch. And I'm sure we'll be in touch very soon indeed, because there's so much more to talk about. Thank you. Thank, thank you both. Thank you.
Bye. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so now, Mark, uh, we have one last item to add. Um, we do. The, uh, a, a pretty big one, you know? So um, I think anyone that's been watching Uplink and it's such a pleasure to see a few more uh, familiar faces coming back uh, each time we do this. It, it's no secret that, um, you know, we're going to have another uplink, right? Certainly, but I think uh, you know uh, the next one that's coming up is uh, well, you know, uh, I think from both of our standpoints, um, really cool. Yeah, I mean, we, we this is number thirteen that we've just we're just at the end here of, and you know, we've we've been really lucky to have some fantastic guests um, spanning all the genres. You know, we've had we've had musicians, fiction writers, scientists. Um, uh, we've had astronauts. We've had we've had Tony Daniels, of course, uh, from Star Wars, um, and this is one of the things which you know Space Rocks is all designed around is is increasing those links between these various cultural spheres. And fortunately, I, you know, I, as part of that, I'm lucky enough, along with Nicole, um, we go to science fiction conventions. So a couple of years ago, I went to a big one in Germany called FedCon, and was very lucky at the time uh, to meet the entire cast of Battlestar Galactica. Um, so I've kept contact uh, with some of the people who were there, and this Friday we shall be welcoming to Uplink um, from the west coast of North America, both Tamo Pennicut, who most people will know as Carl Agathon or Hilo from uh, Battlestar Galactica, the, the new series, and since we were exploring humans and aliens and alien life, of course we'd be completely amiss if we didn't bring the Cylons into this. So uh, the Cylon of all Cylons, so to speak, is uh, six, uh, played by Trisha Helfer. So on Friday at uh, in the evening, I think at eight o'clock UK time, yes. nine o'clock uh, here in, in continental Europe, Tamo Pennicut and Trisha Helfer will be joining you and I for a Battlestar Galactica look at how humans and aliens that you can't tell aren't humans. How does that work ethically and morally? So, morally, so uh, I'm really excited for that. It's it's uh, it's going to be big, and I got to tell you, uh, as a fan of the show, I have many many questions. <laughs> there, there's only uh, uh, one way to, to to end this then, which is that it's going to be awesome. Um, we'll see you on Friday, and um, so say we all. So say we all. Very good. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. All right. See you soon.